um, from uh, the IAS. He, Matthew was uh, got his PhD last year from the University of Chicago with the uh, Liang Tao one, and has since last fall been a postdoc at the institute. And he's going to tell us about new signals from from the communication. So, please. Yes, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, so this is work that's hopefully going to come out soon, um, which is always dangerous to say. Uh, in collaboration with Neymar Cunningham, Rafael Daniolo, both here at the institute, and David Pinner, who's at Princeton. So the outline is, I'll start with a brief <coughs> unification. If you've worked on unification at all, this will probably be, um, well, that probably be too boring and, and, and a lot of review, so I apologize for that. But if you haven't seen it, hopefully it's enough to give you some, some context. And I'll talk about possible additions you could add to the standard model if you want to preserve unification. Um, that will lead us into a discussion of vector like confinement, which I'll talk about in some detail. Uh, and then I'll finish with talking about what the signals for this type of, uh, these types of models are at the LHC. Okay, so starting from the beginning, um, we learned in field theory that the standard model is based on the group SU2 cross U1 going to uh, E1, which is for electromagnetism. Um, and sometimes this is called the unified theory of electroweak interactions. Um, but really, we haven't really unified anything in a sense. We've just mixed two groups um, because we still have two gauge coupling. We have a gauge coupling for SU2 and a gauge coupling for uh, hypercharge, and they go to some other combination. Um, and then we say we can call it unified. On the other hand, grand unified theories are more ambitious. What we actually want to do here is we embed the center model, SC3 cross SC2 cross E1, into a simple lead group. Um, reason being, now you have um, you have three gauge couplings here, but they just come from one gauge coupling. And then when they break, dynamics tells you how they end up being three different gauge couplings all our um, So this is more ambitious, but it gives you some nice um, features along with it. So for example, it gives you the possibility to explain why atoms are neutral, <coughs> meaning why the uh, electron is exactly opposite the proton charge, um, because now you're putting quarks for the proton and electrons into the same uh, representations possibly, um, which can explain why it's exactly zero. It can give you a handle on understanding anomaly cancellations in the standard model. And by, constructive, by construction, it's very predictive. I mean, you have three gauge couplings, you want to have them as one. So it could just be that what you write down um, could just be ruled out by dynamics and it just doesn't work. Um, so, so that's a nice feature of it. Um, so there's sort of two aspects of unification. One is, does it work structurally? Can you fit everything into the right representations? And then two, does it work dynamically? Are you ruled out by, by measurements? Or are you ruled out um, by the fact that you're over-constraining the system? Um, so I'll start with a toy example, just, just for fun. So the toy example here is I'm taking SU2 center model, U1 center model, and I'm embedding it inside SU3. Not SU3 color, but just some other SU3. So now we're actually unifying um, electricity magnetism and, and the weak interactions. So here, what this looks like is that I have to like the SC2 embedding inside SC3. So this is an SC3 matrix. The uh, upper left, um, two by two, is the SC2s. SC2 and then here, I have empty uh, of the third row of the column. Then I can look at how the U1 goes in there. So the U1 will correspond to the other content generator, which is usually called T8, which goes like this, these values here. This normalization in front of this tells you what the normalization is between the uh, the hypercharge and the uh, and the weak coupling at the guts at the uh, unified scale. So here it gives you a prediction for the, the ratio, which can also be cast in terms of sine squared um, at the at the unification scale. In this case, you some number here. Um, in the standard model, you can just choose whatever. So this is why in, in gut models we talk about G1, which is normalized properly as opposed to G prime in the standard model. Um, and this is what it looks like. This tells you how, how the field will work out. Um, but already you see this is kind of predictive. So in this model, you needed the uh, the weak, so the weak gauge bosons from SC2, which are this thing here. So now I'm talking about the adjoint of SC3, breaks down to a three of uh, SC2. That's the W uh, singlet, which is the B. Um, but, our, but now we have more stuff than the, what we started with. So this model predicts that there's going to be extra gauge bosons in the two um, with the hypercharge one half, and another two with the hypercharge at minus one half. So how does matter work in this toy model? So for example, um, you can put a doublet in the top two because we have SU2 working on the on the upper left of this. And on the bottom, you can put the, the singlets. So this is uh, the singlet, sorry, the doublet and the singlet. The charge is given by a TP generator plus a hypercharge generator. So you can see that that it works out actually. So we have plus, well, so this is the, the T3 values of these different states. These are these hypercharges, which was given by, uh, by the embedding. And these all work out. Um, in terms of just group three numbers, I break down the three, breaks down to a two and a minus one half and a one and one. I'll use this notation here because I'll be using this a lot later on. Um, and so this model sort of works for leptons. 
Um, um, but it doesn't work out in general. If you, if you know why. Um, well, you can see that you only get integer charges here. So if I try to put quark doublets inside of this, I won't get fractional charges for the quarks. So this model doesn't work. Um, some variant, so this model actually written down in, in the 70s when people were starting playing with unified theories for the first time. So part of the reason was for showing you a model that doesn't work is trying to um, well, trying to emphasize that the fact that SE5 works so well is, is kind of nice and it didn't have to be that way, but I think it's worth appreciating that not everything right down just, just works like a, out of the box. So here's the embedding for now the standard model, so now we're going to the actual model. SC3 press SC2 press U1 inside of SC5. Uh, the embedding that we have is this is a 5x5 matrix now. The upper left, 3x3, three three, is just the uh, SC3 generators. Um, then the bottom right um, is the SC2 generator, so this is a 2x2, two two. this is an empty 3x3. Three three. And then there's one part time generator left in this group, which we um, give it to be the, the hypercharge. This gives us the, uh, the V1 embedding, which tells us the normalization of G1 relative to G prime. And in this case, there's just a root 5 there in there. Um, does it work structurally? So uh, continuing on with the extra generators, like we had before, we have predictions for new vectors here. Um, so let me just write out explicitly, these are gluons, these are the hypercharges those along the diagonal, the Ws. And now you expect to see additional uh, exotic vector bosons with charge, so they sit in the 3, 2 of SU3 and SU2. Um, in, terms of electric, in terms of electric states, they have a charge minus four thirds and a charge um, minus one third. So these are exotic things that have to be heavy because they haven't been observed yet. So this is one, one prediction of gut models. Okay, how about the matter embedding? So the matter embedding, let's start with the simplest representations of SU5. If I take a five bar, it decomposes into a color triplet with hypercharge and a, and a SU2 doublet with, with some other hypercharge. These states correspond exactly to the states that we already have in the center model, which is the uh, down quark and then the lepton doublet. Next, if we go to the 10 of SU5, it decomposes into a well, into a colored object that's also an electroweak doublet, into an electroweak uh, triplet, and then into a uh, into a singlet with hypercharge. These also correspond to fields that we already have in the center model, which is the quark doublet, the up quark, and the uh, electron. And so this matter, as you can see, this this embedding works out. This gives us uh, the, the SU5. Um, second question is, does it work dynamically? So if we actually look at how the gauge couplings work out, can we actually fit them into this model? Um, so the way we can do this is if we start with a one-loop beta function, so here just tells you how the gauge coupling runs, so here d t is logarithmic, logarithmic running, and then this is given by the gauge coupling to the third power times some number, which depends on the matter content of your theory. Um, so the matter content in general is given by some number times the, um, times the Casimir, which for SUN is just n, then it depends on how many fermions you have in your theory and how many scalars you have in your theory. For the standard model, it works out to be these numbers here, uh, which tells you, so in the plot here, if you look at it, this red line here is, is, uh, is SU3. This is negative, it runs to smaller values at high energies. Um, SU2 is also negative, it goes slightly downwards, and then U1 is going up. And then you look here qualitatively, it sort of seems to work out in the sense that they get close to some scale, but um, when you do this in detail with just the standard model field, it, it doesn't work out. Um, furthermore, you can see that there's some scale, unifies at a scale of roughly order 10 to the 14 GeV. Turns out when you look at proton decay experiments, it's also ruled out from, from that perspective. Um, but if you include supersymmetry, now everything seems to work out pretty well. So now the, the, the running gets modified by the fact that we've added engagenos and, and scalar partners. So it simplifies again to minus 3 times n for SUN plus the number of, of parallel superfields you have. Now the beta function is, is minus 3, 1, and uh, 33 fifths. For SU3 is still going up, so here you can see the kink, which is where I've put in the super partners. Um, here the SU3 coupling still runs negatively. SU2 now runs positively, so it runs positive, and, and then U1 has to run or not. Um, you can see there are two features here that are interesting. The first feature is that you've pushed to a higher scale now, so now you're unifying it roughly in order 10 to the 16, which now, um, in terms of these extra vectors you have, you're safe from, from proton decay uh, constraints. The other thing that we can notice is that or things are running differently here, so in particular, the more matter is causing this to run with a different slope, and so the unification value is actually higher than it, than it was in this case here. <coughs> and we'll see that as we add more stuff, the unification value gets higher and higher here. Uh, so if it gets too high, at some point, then you're losing the perturbative handle on unification, 
And it could still be that it unifies strongly, but then we can't say that precision unification happens. We just have to hope it happens. So one concern we're going to have in the theories we look at is we want unif perturbative unification to happen, which limits how much new stuff we put in. Because as we put more stuff in, these numbers get larger, and eventually this goes higher and higher, and then we lose control over it. So that's what I mean by maintaining perturbative unification. So what exactly can we add in? We can add in get multiplets, because now the, all the beta functions are modified by the same amount, so they get deflected. The unification still happens, but it just happens at a higher value. If I add in the 5 plus 5 bar, they add one unit of beta function. If I add in the 10 plus 10 bar, they add well three units of beta function compared to where the 5 plus 5 bar had only one unit of beta, fu beta function. So in general, if we're um, asking how much matter we can put in, we can just say we can have a certain number of, this is the number of 5 plus 5 bars, the number of 10 plus 10 bars, because they're equal to three units of this. And then 15 would be seven units of this, and higher representations just go to higher numbers. Um, and for perturbative unification, the number is about five. Um, there's some papers that claim that the number is actually smaller when you do this in detail with, with two loops and, and threshold connections and so on. Um, but for now, we'll just start with five, and you'll see that um, it only really strengthens our argument that number is smaller. Um, so for example, you can take five pairs of five plus five bars, you can add that in. You could add in a five plus five bar pair plus a 10 plus 10 bar pair or anything that combines up to be less than <coughs> Okay, so if we add in stuff and it's weakly coupled, then basically we're adding things in, in the fives, which as we said, corresponds to the, the quarks and leptons, or in the 10, which again has standard model partners, meaning that everything we add in has some standard model partner. Um, so roughly speaking, the coupling will look like, um, uh, well, we have coupled, we're coupling the quarks to the, uh, to the partners, so the capital things are these new things we've added in, the lower case are just the center of all things we have already. Because we're adding in something plus something bars, we assume they have vector like masses. Um, and you can get this. Um, what this looks like at Collider is you just pair produce them because they're sent charge on their standard model. And then um, you can also singly produce them if you happen to have mixed things substantially with their standard model, standard model partner. Um, and there's a lot of studies on this. Um, this is one example where you can look for references, but I'm doing a bad job of quoting literature here. There's, there's many studies. So in a sense, this is thoroughly covered. So for example, at LHC, you can just look at vector like quark production. And here, um, this is some top partner limit from a theory paper, where uh, you see the limits from, from even current data are about 800, 750 to 800 GeV. Let's plot the y-axis is very in the coupling um, with the center ball partner, which allows you to have single production rates that can get large in some regions of parameter space. Um, the other thing that could happen, oh, sorry. Still talking about the weakly coupled case, you could still gauge the weakly coupled case where you have, by that I mean of all the different, if you add n copies of the extra 5 plus 5 bars, you gauge those, you're adding an extra symmetry, but if it's weakly gauged, it essentially doesn't change the phenomenology. On the other hand, if you take those these, these pairs and you strongly gauge them, then you get different phenomenology, meaning that now you can have some confined dynamics where uh, where they uh, force the, uh, force the uh, things you added to be confined. So this is often called vector-like confinement in a paper um, here. But different regions of parameter space often have different names. For example, <coughs> if you take the confinement scale very low, um, it ends up being quarks and so on. Um, and this has been very popular recently due to the diphoton excess. In particular, these are maybe like one third of the papers that use vector-like confinement for this uh, for the setup because you can get large branching ratios to gamma gamma. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that in this case. Um, these papers cover it in detail. But let me talk a little bit more, more about vector-like confinement. Um, there's a nice analogy to QED, QC, which sort of gives a picture of, of how it works. Um, so a little more explicitly, um, what I've done is this is one five. This is one five that I've added. Here's another five that I added. I can add up to five of them, as I've mentioned, because of uh, well, because of perturbative unification. I, have to, I can only add to five, but I could add less. Then I gauge this way meaning that these components here make up a fundamental of the, or make up some representation of the new strong group. Which means, from the perspective of the new strong group, the standard model get symmetry is just the flavor symmetry. Which means that, for them, the flavor symmetry is, is uh, five flavors, because there's five components of SU5. I mean, it's horizontal to that. The fact that it's horizontal means it's not participating in electric symmetry, which makes your, um, which means you're safe, essentially, from, from most um, bounds of crystal sensitive to electric symmetry. Um, so for example, if I had add three copies here, one, two, three, then um, this would give me a strong group of, for example, SV3, with these things in the fundamental of SV3. Then my flavor symmetry is the fact that I have five copies of this 
So it's SU5, cross SU5, drop into SU5. The pions of the strongly coupled theory will sit in the adjoint of, of the vectorial <coughs> SU5. And then you expect to see other mesons like you do in QCD, for example. Okay, so this is the analogy between QED and QCD. Um, hopefully this isn't overkill on vector load confinement. But so the picture is you have in the center model, you have leptons and you have quarks. And then here, the lower case is the center bottle fields we have. The upper case is the heavy stuff that we've added in, which participates in this new confining force. So if I start out at very low energies, um, and I scatter leptons in the center model, I just go through photons and get more leptons. If I go high enough energy, essentially I'll start seeing strong, I'll start seeing quarks. But the way I do it is I basically, sorry, so these interact already, I see leptons. Eventually I can start to produce quarks, uh, but quarks, uh, interact strongly with themselves, meaning that uh, with QCD you don't see quarks, but you see pions. So eventually, if I make um, scatter E plus E minus heavy enough, I'll start to see pions come out. Um, and these quarks interact with themselves with QCD, but they are produced still with QCD, the same thing, because they're charged under QED, um, but they're vector like with respect to that in their QCD. Similarly, for the uh, for the vector like case here, I have center model fields that just interact with themselves via center model, so I can scatter things together, get, get uh, W's or top quarks or whatever. Then these new things I've added also have center ball charges, so they can be produced that way, so I can produce these things. But because they're under some confining force, um, you actually see the mesons, the pions, and the different um, excitations of the, uh, the strong dynamics. Um, also, in the center ball, you have that quarks or that pions can decay back. So, for example, pi plus, if all you had was QED and QCD, pi plus would be uh, would stable. But the fact that there's also weak interactions um, allow you to to go through higher dimensional operators back to the uh, other particles, meaning pi plus can decay, for example, to muon, to muon. Um, and similarly, you have the same idea here, that these things aren't absolutely stable, but that there's some higher dimensional operators which allow them to couple back to our standard model fields so that they're not absolutely stable, but they all decay back. Okay, so, what, so let's be a little bit more specific about what we could have for this confining group. So let me call the confining group GS. So let me choose a gauge group. It could be SUN, SON, or SP2N. And what I choose here will determine the meson spectrum. Um, so we can actually just write down, since we said we want perturbative unification, we have some restriction that lets us just write down the set of options that we could have. So let's go through the list, and we'll see that it actually ends up being a, a small list that we can just go through and look at the phenomenology for each of these cases. Um, so for, for, uh, for SUN, we could have SU2, SU3, SU4, SU5. But SU6 um, is just too big because we said that 5 is a cutoff for how much we can have for perturbative unification. So putting things in the 6 of SU6 is too big, so we stop there. For SO groups, we have uh, SO3, SO4, SO5, and again, the 6 is too big, um, so we stop. For the SP groups, we have SP2, SP4, and then again, the 6 is too big, so we stop. So this is already a pretty small list, which is nice. It seems actually attackable. But the list is actually smaller than this. So already we know from, from the algebra that some of these are equivalent, so let's take away the equivalency so that we can uh, make our lives easier. So we know that SU2, SO3, SP2 are, are the same, so now our list is smaller. We also have equivalencies between uh, SO5 and SP4, so let's just talk about SP4. Um, and then finally we have the remaining equivalencies are that, uh, well, SO4 is equal to SU2 plus SU2. Um, and then, well, I didn't write down SO6, but SO6 is, is, is SO4. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six possibilities that we can look at. And let's see um, which of these actually work now for the other parts of the model. I just a question. If SO6 is equivalent to SU4, but SO6 is not a perturbative, still SU4 is perturbative? Yeah, it depends on which representations you choose here. So if I chose the six of SU6, sorry, the, the four, if I choose the spinner of SO6, then it's encapsulated in here. So I could talk about just SU4 and I, I cover the cases, as long as I talk about spinners and everything in SU6. Um, okay, so now let's look at the representations I could have. So SU2, I have two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four, and so on. Two, three, four, five, in terms of our limit on perturbative unification in principle can work. Again, six is too big, so we stop there. For SU3, starting the smallest representations, I have a three and I have a six. The six is too big, so stop there. SU4, I have a four, the six is too big. SU5, I have the five, the 10 is too big. <coughs> SO4, I have a four. I also have the spinner, which is in here, which sort of corresponds to the last question of if I had SO6 running down here, 
I just have the spinner, which would correspond to the uh, four here. And then for SP4, I have a five and ten, five, four, a five, and the ten is to be. So now we're, we're further working our way down the list. Um, but now we make the requirement that we actually want our confining group to confine, because we, we claim that the weakly coupled case was, was sort of covered. Now if we want to cover the strongly coupled case, um, we actually want the strong group to actually confine, which knocks out some of these options. These, so that for the SU2, it's only viable for, for two. Three is too much matter. It doesn't actually, it won't actually confine. Um, for SU3, you have three. For SU4, we have four. For SU5, you have five. For SP4, <laughs> you have four. For SO4, the four won't confine, but the two will confine. The fact that the two confines is the same as having one of the SU2s confined, so let's not talk about this case. And now we're down to a one, two, three, four, five options. So if we cover the phenomenology of these five options, then essentially we, uh, we have some handle on what happens in the strongly coupled case. Um, one additional comment to make is that I can actually add, so NF here is the number of flavors from the perspective of the strong group, meaning that five here is the, is the, is the limit because I have five um, elements of my SU5 gut group. But I could just take an SU5 gut group and add singlets onto it to make it SU6, SU7, or, or bigger. So the flavor symmetry here, there's some beta function left over when I choose these things here. It can actually get a little bit larger. So for SE2, I can make it five or six, meaning I could add one singlet in addition to the uh, center model groups. Here I can augment it up to nine, up to 12, 15, and then here to nine. Right, so the, these are our cases. There's an additional nice feature about the, about the theories that we've identified, which is uh, we've already said that for unification purposes, we want uh, supersymmetry. Which means that in the UV, the beta function, the only beta function is this. Um, and it turns out for theories with a certain number of flavors, with, where the upper limit is from um, being asymptotically free, um, and here's some lower limit on it. If it sits in here, then these theories fold an IR um, formal fixed point. And if we um, analyze our theories, it turns out that all of these essentially follow this criteria, with the, with the exception of SU4, SU5, or in order to be in this region, you need to have a couple extra symbols in them. Um, but roughly speaking, um, the fact that you have uh, NF equals the five works and puts these all in the in the Suzy conformal window. Um, now, when we take them in the IR, um, imagine that all their so imagine at some scale that supersymmetry breaks, which we already believe. Well, we have other reasons to believe it happens around the TV scale. Um, if we want to be relevant for cladder phenomenology, um, we can assume this happens also in the uh, in the new sector that we added. So when that happens, um, now the uh, the window that flows to a conformal fixed point is this version here, where this is a different number. F star here is determined by, by lattice calculations, and in some cases by, by um, other estimates. And here it looks like um, applying to our theory. So for SU2, this number here ends up being, well, four is a little bit unclear, six is a little bit unclear, but it looks like five or six is the value for which it um, confines, meaning that um, if this number is six, then if I have five flavors, then my theory goes to a confining phase. Um, so I want to be below S star in order to get strong dynamics. For SU3, this number here is eight, meaning that with my five flavors that I have from the center model, it confines. For SU4, I don't know a lot of simulations that have done this, but if you take uh, analytic estimates that match up to these values here and take them to SU4 and SU5, these values are quite high, and then SU4 is also high. Um, so for all these cases, essentially, we have the case that um, in the UV, it flows to some, uh, well, some conformal point, which lets it run a long distance. And then um, in the IR, once you decouple all the all supersymmetry, um, it will basically confine there. So this is nice because it gives you some reason to believe that the confining um, dynamics happen around TV, which makes it relevant for, for collider physics. Um, one of the criticisms you might have just of, of generic um, strongly coupled models is that your confining dynamics could happen essentially anywhere. Um, and then for, well, for running, you don't really care. But for, uh, for collider physics, if it happens at TV versus a PEV, you care because if it's at a PEV, you basically it's not relevant for, for collider physics, but if it's at TV, then it becomes relevant. So this is one reason to believe why it might be in the range that's accessible for, for us. So I thought for for SU3, I thought so first of all, a few years ago at least there was a lot of controversy about this. And most of the people that were claiming a value were claiming a larger value. I mean, is, is this just I don't know how big this is for you, but is that I mean, larger than eight. Yeah, like eleven. Yeah, that's perfectly fine for us because our number is five here. Well, five to yeah. five to nine, so that would be that would be perfect. But yeah, this one yeah, is fairly recent. But mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, to be honest, I haven't read these in great detail. I just took the numbers out of the letter. Okay. Um, this one, I'd be interested to see SC2, because as far as I know, these are still ambiguous, and I'd be interested to know whether SC ends up being a 5 or a 6. So that case kind of adds a little bit for us. But yeah, like you said, this one doesn't really matter. Okay. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about the phenomenology now um, of these models. So I've hopefully I've motivated that this is something reasonable to look at. We haven't done anything crazy, and we're getting sort of phenomenology that has been covered in many different studies. Um, but there's also some interesting features of it, which I think we'll cover here. So let me first assume that the confining group is SUN, meaning 3, 4, or 5. The other cases of SP4 and SU2 will be different, which I'll talk about on a future slide. This gives you pions in the um, diagonal SU5. The SU5, so you know, the 24, which breaks down in the center model as a color octet, as an electroweak triplet, as a singlet, and as something exotic, which is a uh, color triplet, electroweak doublet with some different hypercharge. Um, let me give these names just so you can see on the plots. So the octet will be 8, the triplet will be pi 3, the singlet will be 1, these exotic quarks will be qx for uh, extreme or exotic, um, with these charges of minus 1 third and minus uh, 4 thirds. And then I'll put the pi prime in here, which is essentially like the eta prime and qcd, just because um, if I'm breaking SU5 strongly, it can mix with the... Uh, with so the I, I lost track for general case SUN, only N equals 5 is allowed in the final list? No, so for SUN, um, I can have SU2, SU3, SU4, or SU5. So you're specializing to SU5? So for this one I'm not, because this is the flavor symmetry. This one is the, so this SUN is different than this SUN. This is the flavor symmetry where 5 is because of that being 5. Mm -hmm. This one is the confining one, which can be 2, 3, 4, or 5. Okay. Yeah, so these, these, these numbers here are unrelated. Um, yeah, so my, what my pions are is determined just by the, the global symmetry. It's the same way in, in QCD how you have, well, QCD, is, you can take it as SC3 plus SC3 broken out of SC3, which is just by coincidence the same as, as, as uh, QCD SC3. But you could also work in the SC2 plus SC2 and then you will get pions. Where this is, this is the SC2 from the pions, and then the SC3, which is the QCD, forces this SU in here. So you're assuming that the vector-like masses are very small compared to T V. I'm going to scan it for them. Um, <coughs> so this is exactly exactly John's question. So here, M is the vector-like mass of the of the new quarks, and if I scan over it, this tells me what to expect for the spectrum of the of the pions. One nice thing here is essentially this is pretty fixed. So I just scan over this, and there's very few of the free parameters. This is um, I don't have a lot of options here, I just get what I get. So the different sources for the mass of these pions, so um, because they're goldstones, you would have said they're massless, but there's different things that contribute to breaking the global symmetry. The first is the fact that um, the standard model, um, the gauging breaks SU, well, breaks SU5 because the other ones are heavy. So you get contributions with, this is the where the confining happens. So imagine this being an, or the order like 3 TeV. This is the different gauge coupling, so depending on how much a couple to each gauge force to get different corrections here. Roughly speaking, this will put a lower band of them at roughly, say, 5% of the of the, uh, of the confined dynamics here. So this case here corresponds to the very far axis here, where I take no vector lift masses. And so you see that the pi 8, which is the red here, because it couples to QCD, it gets some strong, strong um, dynamics here, which makes it heavy. Um, things that are not colored, so for example, the pi 3, which is luxury triplet, it starts off at a lower mass. Um, then there's the quark masses, which give you this relation here, where the mass squared goes like the quark mass times the uh, confinement mass. This you can do for QCD as well. It's the Kalman uh, Okubo relations, which lets you relate the masses between different uh, mesons. And then there's some extra features here, which is the fact that things in electroweak pulse puts are actually split by infrared electroweak effects, uh, which gives you some MEV, hundreds of MEV scale splitting, which can allow for interesting signals like disappearing tracks, for example. Um, so here, here are our pions. So pi 8, again, just to be clear, is the octets. It's color octet. So here we're assuming this plot, this relation that if you evolve down from the gut scale, you get roughly the relation that the vector-like mass you give to the colored <coughs> objects is roughly twice of the vector-like mass you give to the uncolored objects. So we'll just use that here. But of course, you can vary about this, this assumption. Um, but with this assumption, you see that the colored, well, the thing with the largest colored mass, colored uh, charge, which is pi 8, starts out fairly heavy, and then it just gets heavier. Um, 
QX, which is the color state, starts out here, and then also gets heavier because it's a it's a it's a color uh, triplet. Then these things that aren't colored sort of go up slower. There's the the pi three here, which starts here, and then gets a little bit heavier. And then the pi one, which is a singlet, because it's a singlet, it started out without any uh, masses from from the gauge contribution. And then as you turn on the uh, turn on the electrolytic masses, it can get heavier, and eventually it overtakes the, uh, <coughs> the triplet. This comes from the lattice or a model or what? This curve. This curve just flip, comes from computing. So the loop from the gauge balls is in a loop. Those ones can go. And then putting in just the core masses explicitly. So sorry, what's the confinement scale? The confinement scale is this 3TV for this body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably. So we, we start below it at so some you point. Don't, you don't, sorry, so am I missing something? So, I mean, so this are, these things are. I mean, so you have, I mean, to, to know the precise relation between the pion masses and the concurrent mass, there's, so this is some strong interaction matrix element, right? For, for which part of it? Well, for any of these non-zero masses, right? These things are, I think these are, well, these are determined just by Carl Sanders breaking. So these ones, Not at least when, when they're small, you're okay. Here, so certainly, we lose control, and then you have other effects that we don't. Where you have actual coupling constants in the parallel expansion. If you have to, in the QCD case, you have to take them from the experiment. So are you just assuming some values, some reasonable values for them to make this plot? Uh, which ones are you referring? Which relations are you referring to? Well, the fact that for I don't know 40 TeV, the value is of the lightest guy is about whatever it is 600 GeV. That proportionality constant is something that is not calculable. Ah, ah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I think what you can say is just that what I'm actually saying, three TV could be three TV or some other number, but the relation between these mesons is this fixed. Right. Um, yeah. So, so there's even that in principle, there's the electromagnetic effects. Yes. Yes. But anyway. Okay. Yeah. So here, here's some reasonable value. Right, exactly. So the reason about, yeah, so we're using just some parallel expansion, but <coughs> like I say, it could be that this number was larger and the coefficient from them was different, but the relation is still so Here, this even gets a little bit fuzzier as I start to get higher masses, I agree there's, there's other corrections in. Um, as it starts to be that Carl symmetry is badly broken, then, then we lose a little bit of control over what the fixed ratio should be. In QCD, I mean, the relations work out well. Okay, so the other two cases, which I didn't mention now, where I had an SU2 confining group, an SP4 confining group. These are the other two cases. They give you a different chiral symmetry breaking pattern. Specifically, they give you SU10, which is 2 times 5, this is 1 to 10, to going broken out of SP10, so this is the surviving flavor symmetry. Um, so now you get more pions, because SU10 is a larger group. Um, in, specific, in particular, you get pion in the 44 of SP10, which in SU5 language is just a 24, which we already had discussed in the previous two slides. And then you also get a 10 plus a 10 bar. So these are new pions that we don't have for these other confining groups. Meaning that in our phenomenology, the 24, you always have that. But optionally, you can have these extra mesons in the 10 plus 10 bar. These extra mesons, because we talked about the 10, basically have the same quantum numbers as, as Q, U, and E. And so if we give them, well, we can just give them additional names here just for fun, uh, where I just call them Q. So anything with Y or Z is, is colored. Um, and then this E plus thing is like a, is like a heavy electron. So let me remake that mass plot with these extra things in them. So this is essentially the same story where, again, I have the same mesons as before, pi 8, um, the pi 1, and the pi 3. And then this new uh, doublet color triplet just follows the same pattern as what the other color triplet I had before. <coughs> but now I also get some lighter state, which is only a lesser weekly charge, so I get something even lighter than the pi 1. And I also get something that's a little bit heavier, this thing I call Z. Um, ends up being a little bit heavier than the triplet I already had, but a little bit uh, lighter than the than the octet. So just to gloss a little more about this, um, sorry to be blunt, but um, so you know the the ones that are non-zero even at zero quark mass, right? Those are getting their mass from uh, QCD and electroweak loops, right? And the ratio of that is certainly determined by group theory, so that's totally fine. But then the other one, the ratio between that, those masses, and the ones that are going to zero is actually not fixed. Right? So one could imagine that you, know, you should multiply. Yeah, you're saying these ones. the lower one, there should be some overall multiplicative factor that you should see. Right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's fair. There's only one that actually goes to zero. This one looks like it goes to zero. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's completely fair. The pipeline. Okay. So that's There's additional uncertainty actually on the pipeline, which I'll tell you in a second. But this is all. Actually, I'll come to that after. So the real pions, by real, I mean things that had zero vector chart. Well, things that are in real representations of the uh, of the center model group, meaning anything with a pi in its name. Eisons are singly produced through, through the global anomaly here. Where, so GA, GB are couplings of GH bosons A and, and B um, and with some suppression from the Kyle symmetry breaking scale. Um, so pi 1, which is the singlet, can be produced in gluon fusion. Pi 8, which is the color octet, can be produced in gluon fusion. Um, the pi 3 can also be produced but not in gluon fusion because it doesn't couple the color. So this has a much lower rate, even though it can be singly produced. Um, here you expect different final states. So pi 1, um, can go to, for example, well, gamma gamma, z gamma, z z, w w, and then di jets. And then uh, pi eight goes to di jets, but it also goes to something interesting, which is a, a, a gamma plus jet resonance, and also a gamma uh, a z plus jet resonance. So there's searches for gamma plus jet resonances, but there aren't searches for z plus jet resonances. So this would be an interesting thing to, to start to look at. Um, it gives you, of course, the standard resonances. By standard, I mean there's tons of searches for w w and z z and di jets. Um, and the reason this is popular, as I alluded to, is the fact that you get large gamma gamma branch ratios, meaning, well, between 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus um, 3, um, which, is, which is conducive for, for 750. Um, whereas if you had pigs like things, you'd be more than 10 to the minus 5. This is why this is popular here. Um, so you could argue that even though, well, single production is a little bit model dependent in the sense that I have this anomaly factor here. Um, where n was counting well, what's going in the, in the loop, and then f is some scale here. But as I've argued before, just to repoint out, um, one is you can just scale them exactly like this, you know how it goes. But n we said is limited by um, by unification, so there's a fix of numbers you can choose there. And f we've argued has reason to be a relative scale, um, but there's some range of which it could be. Um, this extra ambiguity in the pi one, which I mentioned, um, is, is what I'm saying here. So the pi 1 and the, the pi prime, which is just the eta prime of QCD, can mix um, when SU5 is broken. By broken, I mean there's different relations between the vector-like <coughs> QCD mass and the vector-like electroweak mass. And this has a mixing angle that's, that's suppressed by this. Um, so one thing you can notice is that if they mix substantially, what you could be scared that could happen is that you could play a lot with the Z gamma branching ratio. So all these branching ratios aren't too different. But the fact that the Z gamma gets very small for the eta prime, or for the pi prime, and is somewhat larger for the uh, um, for the pi 1 means that you could believe that somehow there's a region here where you could sit to somewhere that's going to depend on the strength of the mixing. So there's additional ambiguity to the ambiguity you already have from the fact that it was a single to start off with. Um, okay, so moving on to the complex pions, where complex pions I basically mean the charged four thirds thing, the charged minus one third thing that have um, complex conjugates, so they're not, um, they can't be singly produced. They can be pair produced just because they're colored. So here, this is the, the blue line is colored triplets. There's different pairs you can make of them. And then this red line is this octet, which I told you could be singly produced, but it can also be doubly produced and with a strong rate because it's an octet. And then all these different lines here are for the different electroweak production modes, where I have the charge and neutral, pi 3, and so on. I could also have um, well, electroweak modes for the, for the uh, colored quarks, but again, these are highly subdominant to the QCD, so this is not so interesting. And as a rough rule of thumb here, you have that the uh, colored pions have an order 10 to 100 femtobarn uh, rate, these ones here, for some roughly TV mass. And the uncolored pions have roughly uh, a femtobarn rate um, for, the, uh, for their mass. So the phenomenology, of course, depends on the decays. But one thing that's interesting to note is that because everything is, um, well, because the fact that the colored pions interact strongly, is, um, well, it gives them a higher cross-section, but it also is exactly what makes them heavier. So a priori, it's not so clear what's your first signal, because the color pines are produced stronger, but they're also heavier, so you have a lower rate from that. And you also have higher backgrounds. The uncolored pions have a lower rate, but they're lighter and they have lower backgrounds. So it's sort of a detailed question of what you actually expect to see first in these types of models. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the decays of these new particles, because we talked about the decays of the of the uh, real pions, these complex pions, how they decay. Uh, so here we imagine there's some higher dimensional operators breakdown. So this is a dimension uh, seven operator. 
Um, this is this is to a quark and electron. This is to a well, to a lepton and a quark, and this is to two quarks. So you grant that everything consists of gauge symmetry, and then exactly which one you choose depends on the baryon and lepton number assignment you give to the constituents of this quark here. Um, the decay length, for some reasonable parameters, is sort of borderline prompt or, or displaced. In this case, for dimension 7 decay, this is about a millimeter, um, and then depending on some parameters, which means that it could be just that it's collider stable if you have a high, um, if you have a high um, scale that generates these operators, uh, in which case your, your phenomenology is you have colored particles that are stable on collider scales, and then over some length um, that's much longer, they decay. So this, they will hadronize in the vector, make the R hadrons, there's such for these. Um, and then the colored mesons, which, sorry, the uncolored mesons, which I'll talk about in the next slide or so, um, could also be collider stable. Then they wouldn't be R hadrons, but they'd be massive charged particles. So in that case, you look in your detector, you see some charged heavy particle going through, and you can just look at the, the energy deposits there. You can just draw on that as well. Okay. So for the baryon lepton number assignments, if I give this heavy D a baryon number of 1, a lepton number of 0, and this heavy L a lepton number of 1, Baron number of zero, which I could just call the normal thing, that's what you would just default to calling them. Then I get the decays that this um, ion here, the charge minus one third, will decay to a lepton plus a uh, jet, which looks like a leptoquark, or to a well, to missing energy plus a jet, which looks like a squark. And the charge one will decay to a lepton plus a, a jet, which looks like a leptoquark. So here we can already recast leptoquark bounds and deal with some, um, um, some limits on what the Again, like I mentioned, you can also have more exotic assignments here. So for example, this D could get baryon number minus two, the L could get baryon number zero. This would allow, so in the brackets here, this is just a QX. I'm just writing a constituent form. Here, I would get um, well, a digit resonance here. Um, but this is a little bit of a funny assignment here, which you could uh, well, look at as well. Uh, there's also a finite number of these assignments you could do. You can just go through all the different decays, um, because Essentially, when you go to higher different assignments, the uh, operator dimension to write down gets higher and higher, which means because the dimension 7 is already borderline, um, they're all going to be collider stable, which means all your signatures just de de degenerate into R hadrons. So essentially, by looking at R hadrons and by the prompt cases, you, you can go through the list of all possible uh, decays. So, you remind me of the question I had, which was, uh, is there any proton uh, instability in this model? Yeah, so you get exactly the same proton instability you get from normal gut model material. Okay, but you have all these X, all these X, only from the unification of 10 to the 16? Yeah, so or for these ones, in this case, we're imagining whatever we put in to generate these is preserving baryon electron number, in which case it won't, it won't do that. If you put in a completion that violated baryon electron number, then you exactly have to worry about it. Or we're assuming that whatever you put in to generate these decays will preserve baryon electron number. <clears throat> okay, so the other pines just go through the decays. This thing that looks like a heavy electron decays to a lepton <coughs> plus a uh, plus missing energy, so a lepton or like a W prime, for example. There's also these other um, color charged ions, which go to a, again look like leptoquarks or squarks. Um, and this is for the normal baryon lepton number assignment. Of course, there's slightly different decays um, for other cases. Um, and then this other colored meson, which is a single of, of electron weak, um, gives you digit resonance. So here you just have two, two, two jets. Um, one interesting thing is now when these other pions are present, which is the case for a confining group of sp4, um, but not for just sp3 or whatever, then the qx, so this other meson I had before, can actually have different decays now. Before, I had to go through higher dimensional operators um, to, you remember? Had to go in this way. This they took a lepton <coughs> plus a uh, plus a quark. But now it can actually go to another one of the mesons plus a lepton and a quark. So you can actually get cascades in the other side, which are kind of interesting. It gives you uh, a jet plus a lepton plus this thing, which now will probably decay to a lepton plus missing energy. And same thing on the other side. So this is something I think a little bit novel. These cascades instead of the, the pions issue. Um, okay. Let me say a few words about the, the vector that you expect, because they can also um, limit put limits in the parameter space. So for the SUN cage groups, you get uh, vectors in the same 24, so they break down essentially with the same numbers. For SU, SU2 and SP4, 
you get vectors um, in the 24, which are here, but you also get vectors in the 15 and 15 bar from, uh, from the group, which means that your vectors under standard model charges give you kind of interesting things. They give you a sextet with some uh, hypercharge value. They give you an uh, electric triplet that is not real, but it's complex. So it leads to, for example, doubly charged states. And then it also gives you something that's just uh, like things we've already seen, which is the uh, color triplet and electric doublet. So these can give potentially interesting signals, but given that you expect the vector mesons to be hot, heavier and, and not light like the ions, um, this won't be um, discussed in as much detail. Um, what is relevant is the real vectors, meaning the, uh, again, the ones, these ones here. So things that have the same quantum numbers as the blue ones, as the Ws, and as the B. As you can see, because their vectors are the same quantum numbers, they can just mix. And they mix with the strength given roughly by their coupling versus the coupling that's characteristic of the strong sector, um, where we just take the log and estimate it to be 4 pi over whatever the, the n value is here. Um, what this does is induces couplings to fermions between the, uh, so pi, so this is the octet um, new heavy vector we're adding in, and it couples the QQ bar, for example. Likewise for, uh, for, the, for the triplet um, vector and so on. Um, and this is sort of analogous to the row photon mixing in QCD where you have decays, for example, to inside of the strong sector, so rho to ions is about 100%. Then you have some suppressed coupling to fermions, which is how you would, for example, produce rho in electron positron collider. Um, but also, at some point, the pions get too heavy, and then you can't, you can't decay into them anymore because it's kinematically disallowed. And when that happens, you can take over by rho going to pi plus a vector. That's also possible. And this is some suppressed value in, in, in QCD. So I guess I haven't forgotten how do I know that there must be mixing? Um, they just have the same the same quantum numbers here for the vectors and the well, that's good. there can be mixing, but how do I know that there must be mixing? Yeah, I suppose if you wrote down a UV theory for everything, it could be that there's no mixing. So we're taking the effective theory approach and assuming that there's just no mixing. So if the pions are lighter, which can happen, then you dominantly just get rows going to pions, in which case all you've done is essentially <coughs> increase the rate of pion-pion. Um, if the pions are not as light, meaning that you can, you, can, you can no longer decay to a pair of pions, then what starts to become dominant is one pion plus a jet or a vector. Um, and then eventually <coughs> fermions can also contribute with some sizable rate, depending on the mixing size. So here, just to give it graphically, um, this is increasing the, the um, vector-like mass of the pions. So here you start off with pi pi being dominant. Then eventually when it goes um, become kinematically disallowed, you switch over to these dotted lines, which are a single pi plus a vector. And then QQ bar can also be relevant when this eventually gets to watch out. So there's different decay modes that are relevant in different regions of parameter space. Okay, so to finish off, let me just show you the bounds that already exist um, on the model. So here, this is varying the vector-like mass of the quarks. This is a variant the EV scale where everything is generated from 1 TV to 7 TV, and this is assuming the large end scale and everything. So these are limits you can't get around because pi 8s, as we said, are present. The octet are always present in the theory. Um, you can look for pair pi production going to, uh, to each to a pair of jets. So you have paired diajet searches. Those are already pretty constraining. It forces you to have a cutoff of, well, of above about 2 TV or to have heavier, uh, heavier pions. Pion going to two jets, so just the digit resonance is also constraining. It also um, takes a little bit of power space away here. Okay. Now if I consider the case where the extra things I added in are collider stable, meaning you get R-hadrons, um, this is what it looks like for the R-hadron case, these little things here. So this is actually quite constraining. Uh, but these, in a sense, you can sort of get around because they're not guaranteed. It depends on how they decay higher dimensionally. And then here, it's actually very constraining, is when you have a stable thing that's not colored. Um, it actually pushes up a lot over here, and then it gets weaker than the, than the colored stuff over here. <coughs> just to be clear, everything below is really loud, right? Or just some uncertainty bands? Yeah, this is uncertainty band from the fact that our hadrons are have some uncertainty associated with them. These ones, yeah. If these are actually in your model, then it's all ruled out down here. But since it's unclear whether you need these in your model, then you put them in, in straight lines. So what are the corresponding masses of the pions? I guess they're like, here's some other plot that so the masses essentially follow these contours because it's set on that. So here this corresponds to roughly 500 GeV of pi 8s. This corresponds to roughly 350 GeV of, of E's. And this corresponds to roughly 1.2 TeV of, of Q's. And then of course it goes up in contours. Um, okay. 
if they're not stable and have these leptochromic decays that we mentioned, this is what it looks like here. So now, um, these are the well, these are the leptochromic -like decays. For example, the muon and jet goes this way. For tau and bees, it's slightly different. Goes down here. Um, and so depending on what flavors it goes to, it can be have a different value. So now I'll put both of them on, and then additionally, these pi eights when they mix with uh, when they mix with blue ones, you can get digit, and they can also constrain some of the parameters around here. And then finally, just uh, I guess this is our one um, our one reference to the diphoton um, story. Here, if you put different, um, well, here you can actually put on the plane where the diphoton rate would be. This is fixing it to be 715, fixing to get 5 femtoparton rate. Then you get the SC2 sits over here and SC4 sits over here. This is two less sample values. Okay. So. Yeah, so one is, well, here you're evading things. You could just have it these decay in different ways, and they're not there. The other thing you can do is you, you fix the relation between the uh, colored and the uncolored things. You can play with that relation if you think there's extra additional gut breaking. And then you can play with, I mean, you can play with the scaling. So we're being fairly, uh, um, we're just yeah. using certain values here. But you can, of course, if you want to fit an excess, you could shift things around. They usually take pretty large n values, so they'll move it, n values will push them up here. Uh -huh. And I think they're not too concerned with these different um, leptocorp decays. So for them, they're safely away from digest. And then if you don't talk about <laughs> these decays, then, then you're safe. So is there is there a concrete example of, uh, of, of some decay of these other pions that would be completely safe? Um, you mean getting rid of these bouncers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah if I'm modern, modern dependent, but do you have a specific example where in mind of where how they could decay? Yeah, so if I take the QX, I can remember. <coughs> So I think one example is if you give the capital L's zero lepton number to make them Higgs-like, then your decays will be jet plus missing energy. So now instead of having leptocork bounds, you have spark bounds, which will be weaker. I don't know exactly where they go, but given that this is like one, given that this is 1.2 TV, I would think that they would go on this side. So that's one way you can make them. So to conclude, so basically what we want to do is ask what we could add to the standard model and still maintain perturbative unification. Um, I've argued that there's weak couple of standard model part part partners, partners um, which have been covered in the literature and by searches that are already been done. Um, if you take into account the strongly um, interacting case, which is what we did, then you get heavy hadrons in, in groups of, well, in the 5, 10, 24. But interestingly, you don't get bigger groups, than, bigger representations than that. So you can basically just cover these options and, that, and that's what you have. And then we have reason to believe that it's reasonable to put it in a TV scale. Um, then you get a variety of hadronic states. So there's existing searches which, which we recast and on the previous slide we get digit, pair digit, and boson, leptocorks, champs, etc. This is kind of fun because a lot of these searches, um, they exist for other reasons, but it's nice to sort of have a framework that has them all in it just, just for fun. Um, and there's also new searches that haven't been done yet. For example, resonances between a Z and the jet. There's these resonances where you have four vector bosons where they each pair up into a, into a resonance and then all together into another resonance. Um, and then there's these pion cascades, which are kind of fun, which you get in CZ, but um, usually not these types of setups. And then, and then it's up. Thanks. Any more questions? For Matthew? Yeah, I have a question. Since, since you are adding matter to, to your theory, basically, do you really need supersymmetry to have unification of the couplings? Or can't you play with, I mean, non-supersymmetric model and just uh, you, could, yeah, you, could, you could add random stuff yeah. about the confinement scale to mock up the writing, but it just end up looking like supersymmetry what you got in anyways. And also, it's nice for the EV behavior. We really oh, this, this is okay. Yeah, sure. But the actual low energy phenomenon is that we don't, don't get it. But for the full story, I think it, it makes everything so nice and nice. So if you go to the, uh, sort of the general model, I guess you can push the 
This one you're still fixed around 10 to the 16 GB. What keeps it from being higher? One would you get the same unification scale when you have more vector like stuff. Yeah, I guess so. It's a higher it's a high, higher loops that moves around the bed. Yeah, I guess that's so. And the good time you can experiments reach that level. <laughs> There's only two hours of managing away from the scale. And are the final states expected for a good time to pay any different than so what you're doing is in the suits and context, I guess it's the same kind of thing. Yeah, it's the same. Okay, if there are no more questions, thanks. Thank you again.